Welcome back to the channel. Today we're diving into the freshly released Linux kernel 6.15, which Linus Torvalds officially merged after a calm final week and called it nothing particularly scary. As always, this update brings a broad set of improvements and a few changes that have sparked debate among kernel developers. In this video, we'll walk through the most noteworthy additions, from new graphics driver support and core subsystems to file system optimizations and hardware enablement. By the end, you'll understand what's changed under the hood and why it matters for your Linux experience. Graphics and Driver Updates Let's start with graphics. Linux 6.15 introduces a foundational stub for a brand new open source NVIDIA driver called Nova. If you recall, Nuvo has been the community's go-to NVIDIA driver for years. Nova is intended as its successor for modern GPUs built on NVIDIA's GSP architecture. At the moment, it's just the early groundwork, no display side code yet, but the exciting twist is that the driver is being written in Rust. While it won't affect your desktop immediately, pay attention to Nova as it evolves. NVIDIA support on Linux has had its ups and downs, so a fresh Rust-based driver could eventually reshape things. Meanwhile, Intel's XE graphics code continues to mature. In 6.15, the XE driver gains shared virtual memory, SVM, support, which allows the CPU and GPU to share memory pages more efficiently. There's also a new device wedged event, so if your Arc GPU locks up, user space software can be notified immediately. Plus, Intel added hooks for reading GPU and RAM temperatures via the HWMON interface on Arc hardware. These under-the-hood tweaks help with performance monitoring and stability. Core subsystems, FWCTL and IO underscore Euring. One of the most talked about additions in 6.15 is the new firmware control framework called FWTL. This subsystem lets user space make defined remote procedure calls, RPCs, to firmware on devices. Initially, it supports 140 devices, Mellanox MLX5 network adapters, and AMD slash Pensando distributed services cards. In essence, FWCTL is meant to standardize how firmware is configured, updated, or debugged from user space, all through a secure interface. Proponents see this as a step towards safer, more uniform firmware management, but some developers have criticized it for not following traditional kernel development conventions and argue that existing interfaces might have sufficed. Either way, FWCTL is now part of mainline, and we'll see how the community adopts it. Along the same lines, 6.15 adds a new security hook for ION Euring, the asynchronous I.O. interface that's grown immensely popular. This hook allows CLinux to apply policy controls to various data flows within ION Euring, theoretically tightening security. Linus Torvalds himself grumbled during development, questioning its necessity and complexity. But from a high-level perspective, the goal is to let policies distinguish between different data types that pass through IOA Euring, preventing unauthorized access. Whether this extra layer is worth the added complexity remains to be seen, but it's part of the 6.15 feature set now. Networking enhancements, zero copy receive, and TCP options. On the networking front, Linux 6.15 brings zero copy receive to IO underscore Euring, Traditional network stacks copy packet data from the kernel into user space buffers, which adds CPU overhead. Zero copy receive, often abbreviated ZTRX, lets data flow directly into user space memory without that extra copy step. Unlike earlier zero copy approaches, which required strict memory alignment or complicated MAP setups, ZTRX is designed to be straightforward, no alignment requirements, no special MAP calls. Performance-sensitive network applications like high-performance servers or custom packet processors stand to benefit. In future releases, the plan is to extend zero copy to write data directly into device memory, reducing overhead even further. Linux 6.15 also introduces a new TCP socket option called TCP RTO Max MS. 
This lets applications specify the maximum retransmission timeout in milliseconds for IPv4 connections. In other words, if your network link is spotty, you can fine-tune how quickly the TCP stack retries after a timeout rather than relying on the default back-off algorithm. Network engineers and developers building custom networking stacks will appreciate that extra control. Finally, a new Phenotify API in 6.15 allows applications to receive real-time notifications when file systems are mounted or unmounted. That means security demons or monitoring tools can watch for changes to mount points and react immediately, rather than polling or relying on less granular mechanisms. Storage and block layer improvements. Moving into the block layer, Linux 6.15 adds support for hardware-wrapped encryption keys. In practical terms, this lets the kernel hand encryption keys directly to a storage device's hardware, such as an SSD, without keeping the key in main memory. By never exposing keys in RAM, this reduces the risk of an attacker reading encryption keys if they compromise the system. For systems that rely on full disk encryption or hardware encryption features, this is a meaningful step toward better security. File system upgrades. Let's now cover file system changes because every kernel release has those. In 6.15, the FUSE subsystem can enforce timeouts on unresponsive user space servers. If you've ever mounted a remote file system, say an SSHFS volume, and the remote end becomes unresponsive, views would often hang indefinitely. Now, if the user space fuse server doesn't respond within a configurable timeout, the kernel will detect it and prevent the whole system from stalling. Also under fuse, file names longer than 1024 characters are now supported. This is mostly edge case territory, but it removes a long-standing limit on maximum file name length for fuse mounts. A standout for XFAT users, Linux 6.15 dramatically speeds up file deletion when using the discard mount option. Thanks to contributions from Sony developers, deleting an 80 gigabyte file on XFAT went from taking more than four minutes down to about 1.6 seconds in tests. If you frequently handle large files on XFAT volumes, common for cameras, SD cards, or shared USB drives, you'll notice that deletion is almost instantaneous now. Over in BTRF's land, 6.15 makes two important changes. First, if you try to use direct I.O. on a file that requires checksums, BTRFs will now transparently fall back to buffered I.O. instead of throwing a checksum mismatch error. This behavior improves compatibility with virtual machines and other workloads expecting checksums. Second, BTRFs has introduced support for real-time ZSTD compression levels ranging from negative 15 to negative 1. While higher negative levels trade off compression ratio for speed, this gives users more flexibility to choose performance-oriented compression settings when they don't need maximum disk savings. The file system's defragment IOCTL was also updated to accept these negative compression values, so defrag operations can run with faster, lighter compression by default. For those experimenting with BKHFs, the newer copy-on-write file system that's not yet mainline but is already widely used, 6.15 brings some enhancements too. It adds a scrub operation to find and repair file system errors, akin to a self-healing feature. Additionally, BKHFs can now support block sizes larger than the system page size, which can be useful for certain storage configurations. ARM and RISC-V enhancements. On the ARM side, Linux 6.15 expands support for various devices, particularly embedded and edge-oriented boards. A notable addition is a new device tree file for Google's Pixel 6 Pro, codenamed GS101, making it easier to run mainline kernels on that smartphone flagship. Basic support for Allwinner A523 SoCs was also merged, covering a range of low-end to mid-range boards that use that chip. For RISC-V, the kernel adds support for the MILK-V Jupyter ITX board, another open-source hardware showcase. It also implements the BFLOAT16 floating point extension, plus new instruction set extensions named ZBKB, ZAMO, and Zalersk. These additions improve both numeric performance and compatibility with more RISC-V hardware designs, device driver, and peripheral updates. A few handy driver updates land in Linux 6.15 that regular laptop and peripheral users will care about. First off, 6.15 includes two new drivers for Apple's Touch Bar, one for Intel-based MacBook Pros, and a separate one for M1-M2-based models. 
even though Apple dropped the touch bar on M3 models, if you have an older MacBook Pro and run Linux on it, you now get backlighting, touch interactions, and dynamic function key behavior out of the box. Another welcome addition, a Samsung Galaxy Book Driver. If you picked up a Galaxy Book and installed Linux, you might have noticed missing ACPI events and power management features. With this new driver, your Galaxy Book's battery charge thresholds, function keys, and platform profiles work properly under mainline kernels. On the controller front, PlayStation 5 gamepads now get first-class support, and racing wheel and flight sim gear like Moza Racing and Camus devices see improved force feedback handling through the Hyde PiDef driver. Two newer Xbox accessories, the Turtle Beach Recon and Stealth Ultra controllers, are also supported via the X-Pad driver, along with the power-wired controller for Xbox. Finally, if you happen to own a device with Intel's killer E5000 Ethernet chipset, you get support now too. Intel's implementation turned out to be a rebranded Realtek RTL 8126, which the kernel has supported for a while. Now it's explicitly recognized as Killer E5000. Miscellaneous Improvements Beyond these headline features, Linux 6.15 brings a slew of smaller but still impactful changes across subsystems, 